advocate if we're live doing the screen with yeah, yeah. I'm an only child, so I'm stingy that way. <laughs> I'm an only child as well. Uh, I have a sister, but we didn't meet till we were grown up. So you get me. <laughs> you get the selfishness. <laughs> it's not selfishness. It's not selfishness. It's boundaries. Okay, I like that better. <laughs> I, I like having things that belong just to me. <laughs> you know, I actually know people from large families that have the same issue. Yeah, I can see that. Because they have to ship it better. Yeah, it better. Okay. All right. Yes. It, yes. Everyone should be you able hear me. to hear me. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 We're just getting some conversation before the actual presentation. And, the one, like that. and, and it was Renee who introduced me to it because she has it. And one of the reasons is because in regular green screen, if you lift a book, it blurs, right? But look, it doesn't blur. I can lift it all over the place. It doesn't blur. So I can hold books up for you tonight, and it's not going to be going, you going, wait, I disappeared the fog. So Absolutely. it's 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 so good for show and tell. Yeah. I love my green screen. Yeah. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So I just want to welcome everyone to our author presentation. My name is Renee Edwards, and I'm the Program and Educational Services Director for Fairfax County Public Library. Laurel will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and at around 7.45-ish, we'll open it up for a Q&A. So please put your questions or comments in chat. Questions will come directly to me. This presentation will not be recorded. And now please allow me to introduce our speaker. Laurel K. Hamilton is the author of the number one New York Times bestselling Anita Blake Vampire Hunter series and the Mary Gentry Bane Detective series. A Terrible Fall of Angels is the first novel in a new series that features Detective Samuel <laughs> in a world where angels and demons walk among us. With more than 40 novels published, let me, come, let me finish bragging about you and your accomplishments. With more than 40 novels published, Laurel continues to create groundbreaking fiction inspired by her lifelong love of her lifelong love of monster movies, ghost stories, mythology, folklore, and things that go bump in the night. Her love of the macabre, books in general, animals, and nature led her to degrees in English and biology. She is a non-practicing biologist, but uses her science to add an extra level of realism to her fiction. I discovered Laurel after reading the Sookie Stackhouse series by Charlene Harris, and I was wanting to read more in the supernatural fantasy genre. I read Guilty Pleasures, the first book in the Anita Blake series, and I was a goner and a forever fan. Welcome, Laurel, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Renee. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I wasn't getting antsy. I just realized that the one book I don't have where I can touch it is A Terrible Fall of Angels. The hardback is across the office from me, and I'm plugged in. So I can't go get it. <laughs> and so that's why I was going, to, oh, wait, I missed something. Oh, um, I think I hear my husband. He heard me. Um, oh, my. <laughs> Um, on my desk will do. On my desk will do. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> For those of you who have been married over 20 years to the same person, you know exactly. They kind of read your mind. And you also listen to them. So I'm not that psychic. All right. So thank you again for the wonderful introduction, Renee. And uh, it's usually we just start off with Q&A and I talk to you directly. So this is kind of I haven't done this in a while, actually talked and done a speech in a while. Uh, what kind of writer am I? Am I a planner? 
or a fly by the seat of my pants, or as George R. R. Martin likes to call it, an architect or a gardener. I'm a fly by the seat of my pants kind of writer. And as Larry Correa calls it, a pantser. I actually texted him to see if that was spelled with an S or a Z. It's a, he prefers an S. Uh, does that mean I don't outline? No, that means I don't outline a lot. Um, the mystery I outline, I do the clues and the who or what done it. And one of my favorite things about what I write is I can take a mystery and I get to have horror and science fiction and fantasy. So who or what done it is so much more fun to me. I don't know if I could write a, a vanilla mystery. Just just play by the rules and our local because I so love taking the ordinary and mixing the fantastic with it. Um, years ago when I started my career, when I only had three or four Anita Blake novels out and my first novel out in Night Seer, um, I was actually told by a prominent editor in the business at one of the business conventions. And she made me promise I would never tell which one she was, never tell her name. But she said she loved my books. She wished she could publish them. But she was literally a, a regular, straight, run-of-the-mill, but really brilliant mystery house. And she told me something that I would never realize. And that, she says, because you mix horror with it, you can get away with more violence with a female protagonist. That if I was a, if I was a woman writing regular mysteries, that I couldn't get away with the violence unless I was a man. And you know what? That still hasn't changed. As a female writer, you're still not allowed to do as much violence as a male writer is it's in regular mystery. Horror frees you. Freed me as a writer. It's horror with it. And, it, and, and people expect to be horrified. They expect to violence and gore, male or female or anything in between. If it's horror anywhere near it, all the rules go away. And I accidentally found this out. So I can mix it with anything as long as it's the genres in there, the rules don't apply. Um, uh, common questions. What kind of uh, program do I use to write? Word. What kind of computer? PC. Uh, do I have a word count per day? Uh, no, I have a page count per day because I am dyslexic and I have dyscalculia. Dyscalculia is sort of dyslexia for or numbers, but not exactly. Um, so having those two things, once upon a time, I typed on a, a regular manual typewriter. I didn't, not only was I before computers, I was before electric typewriters, or at least I didn't have one. So you had to do this formula to count up your words, to send your short stories out for to, to sell. And uh, if somebody goes both dyslexia and dyscalculia, I hated that a lot. So I do page per day like I did at the beginning, even though my computer would now tell me exactly how many pages or words I've done, you know, what I want. Um, at the beginning of my career, it was two pages per day. And now it's between four and eight. And sometimes it's 10 to 20 or more. And I learned that I can't count from 20 pages more than two days in a row. If I try to make myself do that, I burn myself out, which is something I'm still learning. As, as my family talks to me about, you know, it's good. So it's very good. Um, so trying to learn not to do that. One of the questions I've gotten, thanks to George R. R. Martin and Game of Thrones is, do I cry or get upset when I kill a character off? Yes. I don't know how he does it. If I ever see him in person again, I'm just doing a flat ask. Because I would be like, I would be in rehab by now, leaping into whatever I chose. I couldn't do it. Um, except the villain deaths. Villain deaths are strangely satisfying. But yes, I now get that question. Thanks, George. Um, and do I use real people for my characters? No. No matter how many rumors you hear. No, I swear. I would collect mannerisms, how people sound, how people move. Sometimes a, a particularly poignant or interesting story will get me. Uh, Narcissus in Chains is based on somebody I saw once at a convention who was this beautiful cross-dressing man. And when I say man, I mean literally for he is a pronoun and he had his hair like, like 
traditional male short, but he was wearing this gorgeous lace black, you know, June Cleaver dress with spider web um, hose and no high heels. He says high heels hurt and he didn't have to wear them. I said, no, of course you don't. He looked fabulous and he did some makeup, but not a lot. And he was just so comfortable with himself. And Narcissus is nothing like him, but that was the beginning of me going, I would like to create a character that is that comfortable with himself wherever they are or whoever they are. But I never talked to that person again. I saw him once, he was beautiful, and he stuck with me. But it's not something I know, it's not somebody I base on, and Narcissus looks different because every character mutates through my imagination. Um, one of the interesting things I've never been asked, though, is do we use your own private uh, angst trauma or do you just do research? And I wouldn't know to ask that at the beginning of my career, but, okay, most of you probably haven't. This is my first novel, and it's the first original cover. Um, that is from a original pic uh, painting by... Keith Birdsong, a wonderful writer. He also did the cover of uh, my one and only Star Trek book, which was Next Generation called Nightshade. And he did the cover for that one. And he said, what do you want? This one, he read my mind. I swear to God, he read my mind. Because it looks like my character. And I like my hair. So I always give my characters my hair since I'm going to screw up their lives terribly. They might as well enjoy some of it. Um, and I got the cover, I was convinced my first novel, since I had no say-so, would be like some bimbo in a, in a bikini that had metal on it. But this was actually a scene from the book where she's doing magic. And so I was very, I loved it. And at the time I asked him, since it was my first novel, I said, can I please ask how much beautiful painting is? He says, don't ask that. You're a new writer, you can't afford it. He was paid more for the picture that this cover's based on than I was the whole book. And that's typical for first novels. Um, years, years, years later, I saw him at a convention, and this picture, the original oil, was in the convention. I could afford it! And so it hangs in my home in private place because I pass it and go, uh, this started, this started, uh, I wanted to write a book since I was 17. I wasn't ambitious at 14. I wanted to do a short story. And so the fact that this came out, I held this in my hands uh, the, the month I turned 29. So literally put it in your hand. That, that was pretty awesome. Um, and it would take me years to realize that really this is just me working my issues. Uh, Kelly was his mother died when she was about five in front of her horribly murdered by an evil witch. My mother died in a car accident when I was six. And there was no one to blame. It was just chaos. It was just accidental. And it would take me years and years after I'd written it to realize that she actually goes after the person who killed her mother and kills them and gets vengeance. Years and years of therapy to know that that's what I did in this book. So apparently I do use my own, my own trauma. And if I'd known it when I was writing it, I'd never finished the book. I couldn't have done it. Uh, guilty pleasures. And she's got the current cover. Renee had the current cover. Oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Because I've come undone. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Okay, she has the current cover. Here's the original cover, the Pulp Fiction covers. Mm -hmm. And here's the cover after Obsidian Butterfly did so well and had a body part on it. So why did we go from this to this? Because Obsidian Butterfly hit the New York Times list. It was my first book to hit the New York Times list. And it couldn't be because I was actually good at writing. It had to be because there was a body part on it, right? So, no, hey. There. Um, so we had this. Why did we go to this? 
because so many of you fans asked me, please God, stop getting body part covers because some of the men were getting jumped in the subway by little old ladies with, and hit by purses and things, saying they were getting pornography. So I did, I said, okay, I asked my publisher to do tool covers so that teachers could read it at the desk and not get in trouble or at the break room and not get in trouble. So we did two, so hang on, I'm dyslexic, this is really there. Okay, and so we did the tool covers. You know what? They don't, everybody prefers the body part covers and all the people that wanted me to do tool covers, where are you now? Once we did what you asked, they just disappeared. I, I, I don't know, now everybody goes, why don't we go back to body part covers? Never satisfied. Um, but Guilty Pleasures, the first, the first short story for Guilty Pleasures, uh, Those Who Seek Forgiveness, which is in my short story anthology called uh, Strange Candy. The cemetery where Anita raises the dead is the cemetery where my mother is buried. Because I knew it really well. My grandmother took me frequently. I remember using a toothbrush to clean the wording that my mother, my grandmother planted plants on the other side of the tombstone. Um, and again, Anita loses her mother at eight. I lost mine at six. Hers is also a car accident closer to mine. I had no therapy. Um, and it's a first person narration because I could not imagine writing a first person narration that didn't share that trauma. That, that is too personal to me, too much of who I was. I hadn't had enough therapy. I knew I couldn't write somebody that had a happy home life because I didn't understand it. So that's why Anita has no mother. And that, because I didn't have one either. Now, interestingly enough, she has no, nobody had any father either. Why not? I didn't have one. Well, I had one, but I've seen him twice in my life. So um, in the current book I'm, I'm writing, which is book 29, this is one, so book 29, Anita finally has talked on stage to her father on the phone. And book 30, we're actually going to bring them into town. Because now, all these years later, I actually know what a father's for. I've watched my husband with our daughter who's now grown. I have watched my friends with their children. I know what a father's for, how they're different from a mother, or from a mother figure. And so I can finally write a father because I have had people actually complain. In Jason, uh, we go home to see his father who is dying of cancer. It's the last goodbye. And everybody was fine with that. Uh, but they weren't fine. I got a lot of complaints that infliction, again, Micah, Micah Callahan's father is sick in the hospital and not much on stage. Why? Because I don't know how to write a dad. I never had one, don't know what to do with one. I was raised by all women. And so I'm puzzled. I, but now I have now been married longer than I was single. So, and I have, for those who don't know, I am polyamorous. So I have a husband, I have a boyfriend. I also have a girlfriend, which has taught me that I'm going to do a side note. When I finally started realizing that I was bisexual and uh, started dating some women and found Genevieve, who is the only woman that I have ever loved and probably the only woman I ever loved because that just works for us. Anyway, um, when I started dating women as well as men, I told my sister, who is a lesbian. She she is an avowed lesbian. She she and I say that she says that she is. Uh, uh, she, she'll date an occasional man, but really she dates women, and she always has, just as I did primarily men. When I told her that I thought that I would have a leg up dating women, since I'm already a woman, I would understand the more than I understand men. She laughed till she cried on the other end of the phone. She laughed till she. She did that hiccuping laugh where you can't talk. And she was absolutely right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you date. You never understand them. You just don't. Trust me, I tried. I tried. I can say this across the gamut. It, it doesn't matter. Dating's hard for everybody. So, sorry. I diverged. Um, so, I mind. Accidentally, it'll take me years after I've written something. And one of the worst things I've ever done is figure out somewhere in the middle that I have 
line, I'm writing something. I figured out way too soon in the Mary Gentry series, starting with the Kiss of Shadows. Um, though the new paperback cover, for some reason, I am unaware of and can't explain this. Why from this to this? I don't know. I wasn't consulted on this one. This is the current cover. This is the original. Um, there are nine books in Mary Gentry series. There would be a tenth book. I'm making notes. And for Mary, I realized somewhere in the early books that I was writing about my first marriage that dissolved and went to heck around me. And that uh, therapy let me realize that A Kiss of Shadows was the most erotic thing I've ever purposely written because I was trying to cheat on a monogamous first marriage without cheating. This was supposed to tell, this was supposed to tide me over. This series was supposed to tide me over and keep me in a marriage that wasn't working. It didn't. By the time I wrote the second in this in this series of Progressive Twilight, I was already separated officially and living with my daughter and being a single parent, our shared custody parent, and dating again in my mid-30s. That was fun. Actually, that was fun. It was much more fun than dating in college. I knew what I wanted and what I didn't want, which I really didn't know in college. Um, but the Mary Gentry series is a failed, failed fairy tale. I originally thought that Mary would pick her Prince Charming right off in the sunset and do the traditional. By book seven, Swollen Darkness, I realized that she was polyamorous and she wasn't going to pick just one because, well, why? Why pick just one if you don't have to? Um, still love this cover. So Mary, the research for Mary also is what helped me change from being Christian and Episcopalian to being Wiccan. So my imagination is ahead of me, it's so ahead of me all the time when I'm writing. And um, it's kind of unsettling to know what comes up on stage because I know that I need to pay attention, that it may come up in my real life, that I was doing polyamory on paper before I knew it existed. I was doing kink before I knew that that's where I do. I was researching going to clubs and and uh, before I realized that it was part of me. So and I write murder mysteries. So far, I'm good there. Just research. But I think I'm finally ready to talk about fathers, to have one on stage, because uh, Terrible Fall of Angels is my first male protagonist. And Daniel, Detective Daniel Havelock, he's tall, dark, and handsome and doesn't know it. He's charmingly unaware that he, this is cute. And that is one of my favorite things. Find something that's really gorgeous that doesn't know it. Um, so one of the reasons that Jean-Claude had so much trouble seducing Anita in the Anita Blake series is because I don't like the guy who knows he's all that in a bag of chips. If you're too suave and debonair, I've had more ladies named crash and burn on me accidentally because I was taught by my grandmother that if someone is too suave and debonair that they've done this before to practice and once they broke into your heart, they'll do it again with someone else. And she's not wrong on that. Um, but he also, Daniel has a little boy who's three. And so I'm finally ready to do fatherhood as well as motherhood on stage. Uh, the motherhood part is book, was been started in book nine from Mary Gentry series. Um, and it's going to be interesting, interesting because I, I don't want to skip around. So many people have babies come on stage and then they skip to when they're more entertaining, like a soap opera where the toddler is carried up the stairs and they come back down 20. Um, it'll be interesting to see how how we deal in the next novel with them being still very young. So very personal things go on. But what are the outside influences that, that I use as a writer? If you read this book, you will know that I played d and You will so know I played D&D. &D. Um, Elves, Dwarves, and Dragons, and uh, I gamed, and it shows. It also shows I read fantasy novels a lot as a teenager. 
But one thing I didn't know how to do, my main character is the one who forges the magic weapons, as well as other magics. And may I just say that I had a magic school that got destroyed long before Harry Potter. This is late. This came out in 92, and I wrote it in the late 80s. So I went to the library. I was in California. So El Segundo uh, Public Library and got the Art of Blacksmithing. And eventually I bought my own copy because I kept checking theirs out too often. And this taught me what I didn't know. It helped round out the gaming and everything. Um, and I do a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of research. One of the first books I did for, vo for Voodoo or for vo Body is Voodoo in Haiti uh, by Alfred Latro. Please forgive me if I pronounce any French while we are on because um, I'm terrible at French. I have been told by French people who speak French in horror. Uh, one French person said that I speak, I speak French like a British peasant. And uh, I said, wow, okay, harsh. And she's, and, and another French person said, no, if she was wanting to be insulted, she'd say, you speak it like an American. Okay. Um, but so for, for Anita, this is one of my first books. Um, for, here are some books. Here's one book that I used for the last book. I, I got this one to read. I got, let's see, Santa Martha, one of the ones I used for the Raphael, the Trek Filipino style. Let's see, Filipino, Philippine mythology, uh, legends of lower gods. Oh, hang on, haven't finished this one. The Latinos of Asia. So how do you start researching? How do you start? Um, find something that says encyclopedia on it. Encyclopedia of fairies is one of the first things I got for the Mary Gentry series. And one of the second things I got was a dictionary of Celtic mythology. Anything by Miranda J. Green is awesome. She's an archeologist. Um, so these are awesome. Go to dictionary or encyclopedia. And here's the thing, if it says that, then you go to the bibliography in the back. If it doesn't have a bibliography, it go. I put it back. If it doesn't have a book list, that's the whole thing is a book list. But this whole last part of this book is a book list. If it doesn't have a huge bibliography, I don't want it. Um, or Terrible Fall of Angels, A Dictionary of Angels. That was the start of it. Yes, all the sticky notes. And so, okay, fine. I don't have a problem. I don't have a book problem. I don't. No, I don't. But I'm always sure I would miss something if I don't do my best to find out new things, to, to try to stay ahead of it. And one of the interesting things is that Anita is part Hispanic. She's, uh, her mother was from Mexico. Her mother was the first generation born in this country. The father's family from Germany. He was originally the first person born in this country from Germany, but uh, she's part Hispanic, and I'm not. Strangely, my sister is. You don't show a mother. Um, but so because I'm representing something that I am not, wasn't raised with, it's another reason I research. I want to get representation right. I was representing before anybody cared. I mean, literally, nobody, nobody blinked an eye that it was 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 what the what the older term was biracial i don't know what the newest term is it depends on who you're talking about who you're talking to um i feel i feel like if you are going to do research and represent you should start with books start with books and then you can talk to people and get their expertise but don't waste their time if you haven't gone to a book or a magazine or if you don't have a stack of books this big, don't talk to an expert yet because you're going to waste their time and their time is valuable. Um, so the latest book that I am currently working on, which is an Anita book, Greek Fire, Poison Arrows, Scorpion Bombs uh, by 
Andrea Mayer is one book. Edith Hamilton's mythology. Oh, goddesses in, goddesses in real mythology. Those are three of the books I'm, I'm using currently or used this week. And it's, I'm trying to do a different mythology that I haven't done before. So to bring it all together, I, I am one of those writers that uses very personal things to me. Not everybody does. And I found interesting enough that the writers who do the long detailed outlines usually don't use mind or emotional stuff as much. Those who don't sometimes do, but then you have people that do both. And I can't write without it meaning something to me. It's like I kill a character, I only weep. If I, even some of the villains I mourn because this feels personal. I don't know how to write any other way. I wish I did. I wish I did because sometimes it's too personal. Sometimes it hurts. It's, it's, I, I'm like a method actor. Trust me when I say some characters, when I write them, my family is not as happy. They know, they know when I come down and who I've been dealing with. Yes, they do. And I, I purposely did this in a presentation that was not cultured, not, not, I wanted it to be more like I write. This is how I write. It is chaotic. It is, it is one idea bouncing to another because until I am ready to write down an outline somewhere and I have enough research and I have enough of the characters in my head, this is how I do it. It's like magic. It's like a sentence in this research book bounces off a memory that I had of somebody I saw at a party and you get Narcissus in chains, you get Narcissus and then you get his club. Um, it is magic. And I have so many people who ask me, how do I do it? How do I tell people how to do it? How, how do I tell you to be a writer like me? And it's magic. Right. And you have your own magic. If you want to be a writer, you have your magic. I know you do. I absolutely know you do. And everybody has their own, their own way of doing things. For me, this is it. I am a biologist. I have a science background as well as English. So for me, it's all about research. And it's all about at least as many resources as I can get to create as much realism for you to read on paper. And and that is, it's an alchemy. It's an alchemy of, of facts and truth and emotion. And, and somehow it creates characters that you, that people tell me have gotten them through the hardest of times. And I, this is all I've ever wanted to do is be a writer. And here I am. And this is really how it works. This level of one idea bouncing into another this is the most honest way I've ever answered the question. How do I write? This is it. And I can give you lists of the books. I can, I can tell you how I start, but it is the, the intersection of all of it that makes the magic for me. And, and I wouldn't know how to do it the way other writers do it, which seems very, organized. I, my creativity can't, I've never written an outline the way they taught me in college in my entire life. I can't create from that. This is it. It's grabbing one book and going, oh, I, I don't know. How does that work? And finding out. And yes, I go to the shooting range for Anita, for Edward. I have never used a flamethrower. Edward, people keep offering let me use things like I don't, I don't want to strap flammable liquid to my back and then put live flame near it. This just sounds bad to me. Um, but I try to use all the weapons I write about. I try to uh, do as much as I can for research, for hands-on, because I always learn more. But this is it. This is the most honest way. I thought, how can I answer this question? How do I write? This is it. I have stripped the mask away as much as I've ever done for anybody, for you guys here. This is it. The chaos the magic, the alchemy. And I can't imagine anything else I'd rather do than this. So is it six? Well, it's 638, 738 there. So 
Laurel, there are about 101 questions in chat. We could have just done an hour of ask Laurel Hamilton all your questions. So if, you would have now, <laughs> if I had known, I have never been part of an author presentation who had this many questions. It's beautiful. So if you're ready, I can start asking. Please, okay, you perfect. could have waved earlier. <laughs> no, we were listening to the chaos, the magic, the alchemy. <laughs> I it, I will say no more. Ask questions. All right. So Shay asks, how do you think your work has affected how the mainstream public views poly and kink? I have had a lot of people tell me that they have the, uh, they're very happy with the positive way I display polyamory and kink. And I've done my research, even before I was part of the community, one of the things that drove me the craziest is that, and still today in the media, kink, kink especially, polyamory less so, but kink especially is considered like, they don't do any research. And then they can put anything up on the screen or whatever. And I'm sorry, this is for somebody's lifestyle. Do the damn research if you're going to do something poo. I have set a higher bar for, for getting your research right. And because I am a part of the kink and the polyamory, part of the community, part of the alphabet soup, um, and bisexual, so I can throw it all in there. Anyway, um, I think that I've widened the audience. I think that that I put out a, a higher bar. And one thing that drives me absolutely out of my mind is finding writers that are writing in my wheelhouse that don't give the same consideration to poly and kink as they do to monogamous, more standard relationships. If you're going to write this, do it right. Great. And then um, Ellen asks, when is the next Amita book coming out and does it have a name? Uh, the Amita book does have a name. I'm not allowed to tell you yet. It'll be this week. My editor made me swear because I'm really bad about giving things away early. So this week I get to announce it. And and there's a cover, but I can't tell you that either. My editor would actually, my editor would be upset with me. So another question before I misbehave. We won't tell us. That's not so okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Bex asks, uh, let's see. I know I'm not the only one in this chat who also does some writing. How do you handle running into the brick wall that is writer's block? And what advice would you give those of us also struggling? First of all, writer's block is, is used very casually now. Uh, if you mean that you start a project and then you don't finish it and you hit the wall, I have never written a book that I didn't hit a wall about halfway to three fourths of the end. There's a point in every book where I think that I have killed trees to no purpose, that I am just wasting my time and it's never going to work. The book will never work. It is disintegrated in my hand. And there's a point in every book, every book that I've ever written, this, this happens. And what I tell you is keep going. It's illusionary. If you can just force yourself to finish the book in rough draft, by the time you finish and have all those pages and it looks like a book, you find that it's not, there was nothing wrong. What was wrong was the negative voices in your head. That's what's wrong. If, if it's in the middle, just keep going. Finish the race. Cross the finish line and you can fix it. It's a rough draft. You can, you can do a rough draft and you can write gibberish. You can write anything you want. It's a rough draft. Only you will see it. You can fix anything, but you can't fix anything that's only in your head. You have to have it on paper. You have to have it on paper. So persevere. Now, if it's the beginning you can't get to, same thing. Just write. Um, on a really bad day, I would start my writing process by writing two pages or more of why I can't write. And sometimes it's too hot. It's too cold. My neighbor is using the lawnmower. Um, that's why I have, uh, in my drawer, I have noise canceling headphones. They're absolutely a godsend when there's too much noise. So finish your first draft because then you can edit and do other drafts. But first draft is like a sand castle. It's not supposed to be perfect. It's not carved stone. It's just sand. Play on the beach, make your sand castle, and then 
we will make it real later. All right, and Talitha asks, um, oh, she says that she's an author, but she has a range of types of books that she likes to write. Children's books and adult fantasy. Would you recommend I have a pen name to keep the two separate, or should I not just care and just present myself for both? I don't think I can answer that question because I've never written children's books. And, and publishing has changed. I got into publishing in the late 80s, early 90s, published my first novels for years. And, um, and now I'm still publishing, but publishing has so changed. So I don't know the answer to that question, and I'm not going to pretend I do. Okay. All right. So Annie asks, which book in the Anita series is your favorite and why? That would be like picking your favorite child. I can't do that. Um, usually the one I just finished is my favorite because it's done. Um, no, I, I, I mean, it was great to go home with Jason and see his family. Uh, Affliction, it was great because we, I did, I did some of the best uh, zombie fight scenes with Edward and Nikki and Anita and others that I've ever written. And that's saying something. And this is the book where she finally gets a big proposal from from you know who. Um, I never thought we'd be planning a wedding in the series, not in a bajillion years. I really couldn't. Um, and uh, I love Blue Moon because we get to see the werewolves and, and finally consummate Richard. I love uh, uh, Killing Dance because we finally crossed the barrier with Jean Claude and, and, and I didn't screw it up. He's been a ladies' man for you know over six hundred years, and I and I, I think I did him proud. Um, I loved Sucker Punch, which was uh, the latest hardback because I finally got to do a mystery, and I had to do things I've never had to do because we weren't hunting down uh, a very animal to kill it. We were trying to save a life, and I got to get the clues like a real cop. And Anita, I got to say Anita on stage. She didn't know how to do it. She didn't know how to behave with a warrant because that's not how her warrants work. It's a warrant of execution. Uh, Raphael was great because I finally get to see Raphael on stage and the wearer rats on stage. I love their culture. Okay. okay. Kristen asks, often writers are asked where they find their inspiration to write. Are there areas where you have, where you've made the decision, oh, sorry, are there areas where you have made the decision not to write about? Yes. My rule is that if it happens in my books, and it is something, if it's a crime that can be done without my magic system, if you can do it without my magic system, it is a crime that some human being already done to another human being. Think about that for a minute, guys. Um, if, if it's something that can be done without my magic system in the real world, and I've never seen it done, I've never had any, I've never seen it done in my true crime research, I won't do it because I don't feed the monster. Mon the bad guys can come up with enough ideas all on their own. I don't feed the monster. So uh, I will not write a real crime that I have not seen done before that could happen in our world without my magic. I won't do that. Thank you. Jasmine asks, did you ever find yourself getting confused about who said or did what with writing a new project in the new um, world? Sometimes when a new character comes on, you have to struggle to get their voice right. Um, and, or sometimes if you haven't written a character in a long time, it's hard to get their voice back. Uh, I actually have a box of props and things that I will use to help me kind of get in the mood for certain characters. Um, Anita, I have penguin coffee mugs and uh, snarky t-shirts and Jean-Claude, it, it's silk and lace. Though the cats, I have to be careful with that for John Claude stuff. Um, Edward, it's weaponry. You know, if I'm having trouble getting into Edward's head, it's some kind of weaponry. Uh, so, so if I'm having trouble, I will go off and write, uh, just write some pages. I'll go to the character and talk to them on pages and go, why don't you talk to me? What, what do you want? What do you want? What do you don't want? What, what do you hate? What do you like? Um, my my th I know I know I know a character when I'm walking through stores around the holidays and I go, oh, I would buy such and such this. 
I have stood in line with presence for people that do not exist outside my head. That's how real sometimes they are even to me, which is interesting. All right, so Valerie asks, will you ever write a sequel to Nightseer? Interestingly enough, I have actually made notes on the sequel to Nightseer. I, I've actually made notes for the first time ever. Um, and it will not be soon, though. Uh, the reason there is no sequel to Nightseer is I wrote the second book, and my editor at the time, years ago, said the first book didn't sell well enough, and he didn't want it. And two move, several moves later, I don't know where it is anymore. I can't even play on my computer, so I'll have to re recreate it. But, you know, I'm such a different writer now, it's probably just as well that I start over when I do it. But you'll be getting a, another Mary book and another Daniel Havelock book before you would get that. That's in the future. Okay, and then Luce asks, does writing ever seem like a chore? Do you ever take vacations from writing? How often do you write every day? Are you required to write a new book every year? A lot of questions there. Um, I'm not going to remember all the questions. I'm really not. I'm here for you. Um, uh, does writing ever seem like a chore? Every job, no matter how much you love it, seems like a chore from time to time. It really does. It takes discipline to write books. But um, every job has what I call the shit quotient. And really, you have to just you have to find a job that you love you love more than the shit quotient is. If the shit rises above your love for it, you need a new job. But I love to write. Um, do I have to write? Somebody asked Stephen King when you write a new book every year because your backlist continues to sell. That's part of it. Part of it is I have stories to tell. Um, I I'm finishing this needed book. I already have a great deal of the next needed book written, which is really unusual for me really unusual for me and it goes back to me not understanding how fathers work so i've already written scenes with her interacting with her father and her stepmother and um but i had to finally realize i was trying to do too much in this book so it's next book and this is another so i had to separate plots out um so when things are going smoothly and the muses are singing around me it's nothing better in the world than you're the flow and on days when you sit at your computer and nobody wants to play in your imagination, you sit there and go, you know, I need to get up and take a walk around the block. You mean something physical? We'll often get that going. Uh, yes, I take vacations. I would be, you, you'll go crazy if you don't take vacations. I don't take a lot. I am learning that I burn myself out occasionally and then it takes me a long time to heal up and fill up the reservoir. You have to do other things. You must do other things. Uh, the last two years, have been really hard because you can't go do the usual things. I have not been able to do what I usually do between books since this all started. So that's, I'm having to find new things to do closer to home, which has been interesting because there's no ocean here in St. Louis. We're in the middle of the country. I'm missing my ocean. Okay, I have no idea. Okay. All right, uh, Sarah asks Are there any storylines you regret? Uh, any storylines I regret? Uh, no. Mm. I regret killing off Gabriel in the Nita Blake series uh, because I think we could have uh, redeemed him, but we would have redeemed him the way we redeemed Nikki. So she would have kind of possessed him and made him a nicer person. So I don't think he would have enjoyed that. And he's probably better off dead, but I missed him. And Ray was a lot of fun, but she needed to die. I have no, I don't feel bad about that one. Um, no, if I feel bad about something, then I don't write it. Um, I may write by the seat of my pants, but I still think things through. Um, I'm going to have to say no. Okay. All right, Claire asks, have you ever thought of writing a prequel to any of your stories? For example, Asher and Juliana's story. I have. Um, because I've written from the male perspective, and I spent years talking to my husband and all my close male friends and asking them, like, how do you go up a set of stairs without hurting yourself? Think about that one for a minute. You know, it's a woman we don't have to worry about certain things. Um, so 
having written from a male perspective, I actually think I have come closer to being able to write at least short novels or short stories from maybe Jean-Claude's perspective, maybe Asher's perspective, um, and, and that kind of thing. Because I, I can now, I've written a whole book from a male perspective first person, it gives me confidence that I can try writing from a male perspective of characters I already know better. Natasha asks, how do you create the mental problems for your characters? Do you just let it develop on its own as you write? Um, I've been in therapy since I was 21. And, uh, you know, I've had enough of my own personal trauma that that it was necessary. Therapy is a good therapy is a lifesaver. I'm a firm believer in it. Um, uh, the fact that I, Nathaniel, going to therapy and getting clean, getting, uh, getting off drugs and, and just all his addictions and stuff and having a happy life, people have told me that that's led to them getting into addiction, getting out, off addictions and going to therapy themselves. Um, I didn't plan on that, but Nathaniel came with his everything. I didn't create that. He just came this way. Um, I love his character growth and how far he's come. Um, and one of the interesting things in doing my research is that male abuse victims are one of the most underreported abuse victims for so many reasons. And I, I have probably more men with that kind of background than any series I'm aware of. And I've had so many men quietly tell me, thank you for representing us. Thank you for, thank you for telling us that it's okay, that, that, that it's, it's okay, it happens. Um, so everybody comes with their thing. And Asher is one of the most interesting. I've had him actually, he's a vampire, but I've had him actually find on stage that he's, his biochemical stuff is one of his biggest problems. And they've now found a drug that can help him even as a vampire. And so he's getting healthier. And I get to talk in this book about how it feels to have been so, so unable to think clearly for centuries. And suddenly he can think clearly and he doesn't know how to do it. It's, it's frightening to him to not have his issues. You get used to them. They become, they become part of you. So I don't plan it. Uh, I have to say, I did plan it in, in A Terrible Fall of Angels. Um, we have his best friend in here who is homeless and uh, it, he manifests, presents his schizophrenia. We find out what is actually wrong with him because not being able to trust your mind is one of the most frightening things I can think of. Um, Lisa says that she follows you on Facebook and she loves the way you interact with your fans and she loves how open you are. Uh, and her question is, is the story driven strictly by the characters? Does Anita tell you how the story moves or are you in charge of Anita's life and the way it's written? Oh, I'm just along for the ride. I have some things I think that we're going to do and I think I know what we're going to do, but uh, they will all surprise me. and. Uh, some writers will, if a, if a character goes off script, a writer will pull them back in and write the book the way they want it and make the character, force the character. And I think it always shows. The characters, it feels stiff to me on paper when I read it. Um, Narcissus and Chains. I had, I had that book almost done. And I mean, I had it done, but it was the very end, it was in fight. And I had this, this whole thing planned out. And uh, my husband, who I was just uh, just dating, we'd been friends for eight years before we dated, so I'd call him anywhere for things. But um, I, I called him in sobbing. And I said, I said, you know, I said, they're too good. They got away. And you and Nathaniel and everybody, they got away. And now that they fight, and I, I was actually weeping because they destroyed the third of my book. And he says, well, what about that thing that happened in the city of Butterfly? And I went, oh, yeah, that's great. And then click, I hung up on him. And three hours later, I called him back. And I said, did I hang up? And he said, yeah, but I knew why. And that is one of the reasons that we are married today, because he knew why and he's okay with that. Um, so, yeah. He gets you. <laughs> he does get me. Um, he gets me, interestingly enough, that when we go to conventions and stuff, they call him Mr. Hamilton, even though that's not his last name, because, uh, and he's okay with it. My first husband, who was his last name, 
he didn't like being Mr. Hamilton at conventions. Isn't that interesting? All right, Kiara asks, this is an interesting question. If Jean-Claude could be human or day walk for one day, what would he do? I would like to take him, and Anita would like to take him to the ocean. We would like to take him to the Florida Keys to see the Caribbean water. If he's never seen it, I would have to ask what he's never seen. Um, I don't know what he would like to do, but we would like to take him to the Florida Keys to see the Caribbean turquoise and blue water and, and, and the beach. That's what we would like to do. Um, he would probably, if it was safe, like to go back to some of the old Europe stuff and, uh, and see some of the places that he hasn't seen for centuries, probably for him. But we need more than one day for that, though. Okay, Amanda asks, have you ever written yourself into a corner in the plot? If you have, how do you find yourself resolving it? Oh, yeah. You, you can't write this many books and not write yourself into occasional corners. Um, how do I do it? It depends on the corner I'm in. Um, oh, thank you. I've seen questions come up. Um, how do you get out? It depends. Uh, like with your sisters and chains, uh, when they went off script and totally blew my plot out of the water, I had something that happened in an earlier book, The City and Butterfly, that could come in and fix it. Some of my own magic and my own plot could come from earlier books to fix it. Um, even if I come into a corner in rough draft, if I know what, if I don't know what to do here, I will literally write, I don't know what to do here. Skip to the next thing. I will fix it. My second draft is just going back for holes. I call it hunting aardvarks because I actually put the word aardvark by anything like that. A name I don't remember, uh, a weapon I don't remember, street. Is there a street there that I need? I put aardvark because I will never, ever, ever use the word aardvark in a real story. And then I can just spell check and go through and fix my aardvark. That's what I do second chapter, uh, second draft. So you can fix, you can get yourself out of the corner later. Finish your first draft. And, and may I say, if there are more questions, I'm happy to stay here and answer questions. We have about 28 unanswered questions. So maybe if, I don't, I think we'd be here for another hour. So why don't we ask maybe, you know, three or four more and then we'll. If, if you have the time, we can do like a lightning round. I'll okay. try to be quick. Okay. See how All many right. questions we can get to. Okay. All right. All right. So. Um, I'm not even going to say names anymore, we're just going to get to it. I am curious what Mary and her men will be up to in the next book, if you can share. Um, I can't share because it will give away too much. Uh, the babies will still be babies. Um, no, I can't. I, I, I'm such a bad hinter. So, uh, the working of the book, I am making notes. I, I have a title that my agent likes, haven't told my editor, so I don't know if I'll get to keep the house, so I can't tell you that either. But, um, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> All right, next question. <laughs> Do you think you would ever write a side story from the Anita Blake series where you focus on one of the other main characters in your point of view? It's a first person narration, so that's really hard. So, no, but I have set up so that maybe Asher and Jean Claude can tell their stories. And, uh, and we are going to be able to go through uh, Jean Claude's limit that he has saved over the year. So, have you ever gotten the inspiration from your dreams and used those in your writing? No. no. If I write enough, I don't dream much. Um, I only have vivid dreams or nightmares when I'm not writing which is interesting. Um, it's like I dream on paper uh, while I'm awake. Uh, I will have characters that come into my dreams sometimes, but it's more like going, hi, you should be at work now. Yes, my, my characters come in and go, you should be writing. Why are you sleeping? Who is your favorite author? I don't have a favorite author. Um, I love to read. Uh, Robert B. Parker, the Spencer, early Spencer books are where I learned how to write good dialogue. 
uh, I'm, I mean, I, I love, love, love mysteries. Uh, you know, I shouldn't know somebody would ask this, but I, I this, this question, but I don't have a favorite. I just have, I love mysteries in general. Um, I've been reading the Terry Pratchett. Uh, I miss some of the uh, Discworld books. So I'm going back and rereading the Terry Pratchett Discworld books that I miss because it's delightful and fun. And I think we all need more of that now. Have you ever thought about writing a book about writing? I have. I have thought about it. But it would have to be more organized than I actually write. You could call it cha chaotic writing. <laughs> writing through the chaos. That would sound like a memoir of the last three years, two years and a half. No. <laughs> uh, uh, or do you plan on writing a certain number of Anita books? Um, I, I do not have an end in mind. If if you guys continue to love Anita and I continue to have great ideas and fun ideas that excite me, then I'll be writing her twelve hundred and three. So um, no. And interestingly enough, um, prepping for the wedding in this one, we finally see some people trying to close. Not Anita. Don't get excited about the dress. I am really dreading the dress. Anita hates the dress. Jean Claude loves the dress. Anyway, um, and family's coming to town next book, and we're going to actually have to have the wedding. And I don't know how to top the anticipation. You guys have some ideas, and the more research I do on on big big weddings, the more intimidating it is. It really is. Uh, but no. No, no plans for when it stops. And I love the fact that I'm working on book 29 of the series and already have most of book 30 and probably book one written already. I, I love that I have that kind of continuity. Um, so, so no plans to stop. Wow. Yay. Okay. Um, very nice compliment. Uh, somebody wanted to thank you for the day. They've been struggling with writer burnout and hearing you talk about magic and alchemy is really uplifting. You always seem to be the hero I need at the right.
I, I'm not in control. No. Uh, did you ever want to do something other than write? Briefly, I wanted to be a wildlife biologist. Um, I, from It's always been biology and writing for me, but I ended up being allergic to the world, pretty much everything outside at 2021. And so, uh, you know, the universe had other ideas. I'm glad. <laughs> Can you promise that if Anita becomes a show or movie, you will make sure it stays true to the books? I will do my best. But I'm going to say something that, um, okay, we'll take this one because it's big. Um, a script is at most 60 pages. A book is a lot bigger. So that's just one book. We are not going to be able to get everything in. And the cast is huge. There's going to have to be some conglomeration. I know I'm not going to be able to get everybody in because there's just not time. So that's been one of the hardest things when I've actually been doing the research on how scripts work, how adaptions work. And because it's a huge cast and it's like, where do we start? Do we start at the beginning and go all the way through? Do you start kind of where you're at? It, it, there's a lot of questions to be answered. So uh, it cannot be word for word because it's just too long as opposed to script. I think I misspoke. I think we're at the end of our, our questions. Um, I think that was, oh, the last one, the final question. Are the graphic novels still being made as the series has progressed? No. Um, the last, uh, Search of the Dam was the last, the first three books have been in graphic form. The last one was Search of the Dam. And when I did not, went to Faye before, did not get made, so I was working with a small comic company and they got bought out by Marvel and I was traded like, like, I don't know, traded like trading cards. I don't know. I was part of the, I was, I was part of the deal. And uh, so I found myself, Anita was very briefly, um, she was a Disney princess sort of, you know, that was cool. Um, but unfortunately Marvel was fine, but then Marvel paired with Disney just before we were set to go to book four, Lunatic Cafe. For those who've read Lunatic Cafe, what is the primary mystery? It is a snuff film. It is not only a pornographic film, somebody is dead, gets killed, and eaten by weird animals on screen in this movie. And the fact that that happens sets everything else in motion, and that is our mystery, finding the killers and getting, you know. Disney did not think that a book that had a snuff film, including cannibalism, was exactly Mickey Mouse material. And so they, they, even though they were selling really well and doing well, they didn't, for Marvel, Disney didn't think that it, it really, they didn't think it, they could put it under the umbrella of Disney at that time. So that is why we had to do the graphics because Marvel paired with Disney and, and I just do, at that time, they didn't consider that Disney safe. So that is why there's no more. So I'm getting, I'm seeing questions come through. Yeah, there. now they're starting to pop up, but I, I did skip one. Thank you, Hannah, for pointing that out. On the topic of props for characters, I wanted to ask what props, what props spawns Nathaniel or Asher? Asher just comes on stage and either is wonderful and sexy or sulky and irritable. I mean, and he just comes on and does his thing. I, I have no props for Asher. He walks on and he's just there. Um, Nathaniel, Nathaniel comes on and does his thing as well. Um, uh, no, I, I no, I'm I'm debating I'm 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 debating on answering that one or not on that. So we're gonna skip that part. So many more questions. <laughs> Oh my goodness, you are, people love you. Uh, my question is, how do you start a book if you have an idea but don't know how to get the ball rolling? You set your butt in a chair and you type, how do I begin? I have no bloody idea. And and literally, I'm not joking, I'm not making fun. Literally, I, I can have an idea for a book even now after writing all these books and yet I don't know how to start. Okay, 
one of the per one of the things I meet so many people that have started their novels and they have the perfect first line, or they're searching for it, the perfect first paragraph, a perfect page, perfect chapter at the beginning of the book, and they're stuck editing that to make perfect. It is if you're a beginning writer, no publisher is going to take you trust that you can finish a book because you don't know. So it is better to have a finished book with a rougher beginning than to have a perfect beginning and no rest of the book. Uh, often the very last thing I write is the first line of the book. I, I mean, seriously, I will write everything. I'll have something up there. I'll have something, but I know it's not right. And I will write the whole thing out. And sometimes I am still editing, fidgeting with the first line of the book. When I've edited everything else and my editor's already seen it, I still am working on the first, first opening. So guys, if you're hung up at the beginning, please write your book, write your, first, your rough draft, because you can always edit the beginning later. And there's no such thing as a perfect opening. There are good openings, there are weak openings, Perfection is unattainable. In the Anita Blake universe, would the blood of a holy person react the same as holy water does on a vampire? It might. It might. It would have to be genuinely holy, not just we're told it's holy. You know what I mean. Not all saints' relics are saints' relics. So if it would be have to be holy. Now, some saints' relics would work because enough people believe in them, whether they're real or not. It's faith that makes it work. Hmm. Will you be at any in-person conventions this year? No. Um, I caught COVID for the first time after I stopped masking and using hand sanitizer. Yeah, went outside without it, and I caught COVID. And uh, I am still not 100%, so... Uh, no, I love you all, but uh, I'll see you next year. Hopefully. I will see you next year. We are going to be optimistic, damn it. Okay, okay. Would you say Asher is com comparable to Frost in attitude near the beginning of the books? Yes, I would say so. And one of the interesting things in that I did during lockdown is I went back and reread all my books in order. And, and I mean all of them. And I had forgotten how much Lawthor in, Lawthor in Night Seeker, my first novel, looks an awful lot like Frost. And I went, wow, I've been working that one a while, haven't I? So, uh, but yes, the moody, beautiful boy with the, the great hair and some, uh, yeah, oh yeah, there's a lot cross back and forth like that. Reese reminds me of Jason in their sense of humor. I mean, yeah. Do you ever see Anita actually having a baby? God, I hope not. I really hope not. Uh, it would it would make it so hard to write the books, and Anita would hate it. She would hate it because there comes a point in the pregnancy where you're helpless. You are helpless. You are out to here. You can't see your feet. You can't walk well. Let alone run. Anita would hate it. It she would be so helpless at some point. Not be able to get behind the wheel of a car to drive. At the very end, you're on their back like a turtle. If somebody can't help you up, you're just stuck like this, like a turtle. No, and you would just hate that. I'm not saying we're not going to do it, but I, I'm dreading it. How's that? <laughs> All right. What is the scariest story movie that has scared you the most? Which one has stuck with you the longest? Um... As a little, as a little kid, I mean, I at five I couldn't watch uh, Boris Karloff and Frankenstein the movie all the way through by myself. I got scared halfway through. Um, horror movies don't scare me. To be just, as an adult, they don't scare me. Real life, real life crime research scares me. Uh, when I started researching real serial killers, I now know things I didn't want to know that our fellow human beings will do to other fellow human beings. And, um, you know, horror has nothing on real life. And I'm a biologist, so I still, you know, read the papers and stuff on, on uh, predators going after other predators. And um, 
most predators, uh, lions, hyenas, they eat from the back, not the front. Because the horns and everything are usually up front, and that's dangerous, and they can be injured. So they eat from the back if they can, which means they eat animals alive. Watch a few of those films. Come and, and come. And real life is so much scarier. And um, so, yeah, that that kind of thing. Real life is so much scarier than, than fiction and, and and horror movies. And I don't like uh, movies with just how many people can we kill, how gruesomely. I prefer I prefer something that builds up that has more more imagination rather than just gore. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I want to share a comment, but the final question is, do you see Nathaniel having a baby? And someone said that he would be giddy. <laughs> if Nathaniel could get pregnant, we would do this. We would do this in a hot minute. If Nathaniel could get pregnant, he'd be gay. Anita would be okay with it. The fact that she is the incubator unit of this group, and the fact that she was jealous when one of the other female women in the poly group offered to get pregnant with Nathaniel because she thinks she wants a baby, he wants a baby. The moment she realized that she was jealous of their shared female lover getting pregnant by Nathaniel and not the moment she was jealous, that was the moment she was picked. That's the moment Anita had to go, okay, if we all agree. Nathaniel, she doesn't want having a, a child with anyone else. And um, I have to say, in research, uh, even before we had our early poly group, one of the things I've researched is that most poly groups will break up from five or six years in if there are two women, one man. Why? Because one woman will want to have a baby and the other one won't. But usually the one that wants the baby doesn't want to get pregnant. And the one that doesn't want a baby, she talks into getting pregnant because it's all their babies. And the woman that didn't have the baby will be jealous of the closeness of the, the other half of her triad that had a baby together. I've seen more of them break up over that, yeah. over the baby question, than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, it's much harder to find a triangle made up of one woman, two men. But if you can find one, if you can find one like that, they will last well, if they make it to five or six years, they're good. They will make it. They will make it through. Uh, because I don't know why that is, but it, it, it's what I found. But the baby question breaks up a lot of poly groups. And um, uh, you also get into if you were dating, you have people with disparate ages. So you have one part of the part of the group. It's a big group. Part of the group is ready for travel and has their children are off. The other people haven't had children yet, and they want children. I, babies are complicated on poly. That's hard. That's really hard. Um, uh, you know, and uh, we didn't, because we had shared custody, my daughter didn't see Polly at home. Uh, she didn't meet anybody I dated until I was serious about them. And so she actually didn't realize that we were Polly until she came home from high school and made a disparaging remark about somebody talking about Polly at school. She was like 15, 16. And I said, honey, and I had to finally tell her, I said, well, we're polyamorous. And I had to, and she says, you are? I said, yes, we are her. And she said, well, I don't mind. I said, because unless we're keeping them and they're living with us, it's, you shouldn't, my dating is invisible to you. It shouldn't be invisible to you. And and she was just like, oh, I'm sorry. And I thought she, I really was worried about it. And like a week later, she comes back to me. She says, mom, I need to talk to you about Polly. And I thought, oh, is she going to hate it? Is she going to freak out on me? What, what? And she says, mom, I'm sorry. I don't think I'm Polly. I think I'm just monogamous. Are you disappointed? I just went, no. Oh. I said, no, I'm not disappointed. I think monogamy, monogamy is good if it works for you. And it was just so cute that she was just worried that I disappointed she wasn't polyamorous too. So if she wasn't weirded out by it. She just, she just was worried I'd be disappointed that she wasn't. So one of those wonderful parenting moments where you're just going, aw. <laughs> aw, sorry, aw. 
Well, I think this is a nice segue to the final comment that I wanted to share. Um, uh, this person said, I wanted to express my gratitude for Laurel's portrayal of polyamory and bisexuality, her honesty and ability to communicate about her private life and her characters embracing their sexuality has done much to help me to be able to understand and express my similar feelings. Well, very much thank you. I am, and one of the interesting things, I didn't mean to be representing everybody, but once I started, I realized so many people came up to me and said thank you, and I realized how underrepresented so many people are that are marginalized in some way. And then suddenly I'm part of the, part of the gang, and uh, it's, it's been very interesting to be to first research it and then go, oh, there's a reason I'm drawn to this. And I am very, I am so happy to be able to represent a positive, a positive role model, a positive, well-researched, well-lived role model for this, because I still see writers out there in movies. Don't get me started on the movies getting it wrong. Um, but uh, I really thank you very much for the compliment and uh, and I am just happy that my characters, that me writing about my characters, can can help us all kind of be more comfortable with who we are. And um, uh, the Mary Gentry books, I'm getting people telling me that reading them has helped, has made them Wiccan. So you know, it helped me. The research helped make me Wiccan as well. But it's just fun, it's just funny that I share my journey, and we're all on the journey together. And uh, I and and I really hope that by presenting how I write in a much more realistic manner than I've ever seen it done before, and certainly me, I hope that that, that helps all you people out there when you write your own to know that it is not it is not planned, it is not careful, it is not it is not a certain way. It, you just need to believe in your own magic. You just need to believe. And even on the worst days, you put your butt in a chair, sit down, write, and go, I don't know what I want to write today. I promise you, if you would sit there and write for a few days, even if you only write, have nothing to say over and over and over again, and, and it's hot, it's cold, the dog won't stop barking, eventually the muse goes, oh, you're serious. And your muse will talk to you because it seems that you're serious and you put in the time. So I, I really hope that this helps everybody out there know that how they're doing it is just fine and right for them. Thank you. This has been, thank you for giving us 35 minutes of extra time. It is very much appreciated. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. You're welcome. I, I love answering questions. And uh, if we do this again, we know we'll just answer questions. Yes, that's all we need to do. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, all right. You. Oh, yeah. Good. You can see the comments, too. I, I saw yes. the comment, yes. Yes. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you. It's just been great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having your video boxes on, too. I have to say, I've never been part of a program where so many of you shared your wonderful faces. So thank you so much for that. Have a great night. Laurel Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Have a good one. Thank you. Good night, everyone.